Today's topic is, will the developing nations be allowed to catch up with the developed world? Our speaker has an impressive bio, but he is such a modest individual. Those who know him will confirm that. Muhammad Iqbal Asaria, as a special advisor on business and economic affairs to the Secretary General of the Muslim Council of Britain, was a member of the Governor of Bank of England's Working Party on the introduction of Sharia compliant financial products in the UK market. He is a visiting professor at London Institute of Banking and Finance, and he also teaches at Bangor Business School in Wales. He has been a contributing tutor at Durham University's prestigious summer school on Islamic finance for the last eight years. Professor Asaria is the co-author of the Chartered Insurance Institute's diploma level module on Takaful. And what is Takaful? That is insurance based on shared risk. And maybe if it arises during the chat or during the Q&A time, you can just say a few words on that. But that is insurance based on shared risk. He has been organizing the annual International Takaful Summit in London, England for global participants. This summit has become the leading thought forum for the global Takaful industry. So in short, I believe he is the authority on the subject of Takaful. In 2019, before the pandemic, Professor Asaria organized the first ever Responsible Finance Summit in London, England. He is an economist by training and he speaks on a wide variety of topics. Just Google his name and you will see the TED Talks and others on the range of subjects he has covered. He was awarded the CBE in the 2005 Queen's Honours List for Services to International Development. We are so fortunate to have Professor Asaria with us today and we listen to him about will the developing world catch up to the developed world? Professor Asaria, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Rabbishrah li sadri wa yassir li amri wa qli luqdatan min lisaani yafqahu qawli. I always like to start with these beautiful verses of the Quran, which were obviously referring to Rabbi Musa alayhi salam, because he had a little bit of a stammer and was worried if the people understood what he's saying or they might misunderstand and he will have a problem. So inshallah, we will take it in that spirit. Um, before I begin, I would like to request that we recite a Surah Al-Fatiha for the dear mother of Nazmul Bhai Damji, who passed away two, three days ago. Bismillah. Yeah. start with, I would like to thank the Baraza and Oil in inviting me once more. As I was telling uh, Nazmul Bhai, that I have actually spoken at Oil in Toronto itself when I was last there with my close and dear friend Marum Gulam Sajan. But since then, I have been following your activities and events, which closely mirror our activities at the Salam Center in London. However, today's subject is a little bit more outside the box, if you like, in these forums. 
they are not directly religious in that sense, but I believe they are very, very relevant to what we need to think about. I'd like to begin by giving you a very small um, reminder of an event which happened in 1953. Just before those years, the, in Iran, a person called Dr. Muhammad Musaddiq became the prime minister of Iran at the time. Dr. Musaddiq was obviously the leader of the National Front of Iran, a more national organization. Iran at that time was under the Shah and also more or less under British rule. Uh, one of the leading companies in Iran was called Anglo-Iranian Oil Company, which is now British Petroleum. Its main base of operation was in Abadan in Iran, and all the profits were going to Britain. Dr. Musaddiq, when he started to put his roots down and build the prestige of the Iranian people, came to the conclusion that this was a resource which belonged to the people of Iran. It was not a British resource. And therefore he proposed to nationalize the Anglo-Iranian oil company. And he did nationalize the oil company. But this is not today, this is in 1953. And there was panic amongst the people who were keen on maintaining that monopoly of the profits. Eventually, <clears throat> the British and the Americans decided that if we allow Dr. Musaddiq to stay in power, we will have problems everywhere else. Because if these people, third world people, developing country people, whatever they call them, get the idea that these resources were theirs and not ours, we will be losing a lot. And so as many of you may know, in the subsequent months and days, they organized a proper coup in Iran led by CIA and the British intelligence and put the Shah back in power. So killing off all nationalist sentiment in a country like Iran. Nevertheless, Dr. Musaddiq had planted an idea which would not go away. And today there is hardly any oil company which belongs to foreigners. They might have shares, they might have profit sharing, but in terms of ownership, it belongs to the people. And that is the legacy of Dr. Musaddiq. So you can see that even changes like that, which are not controversial in our thinking, the thing belongs to the people of Iran or India or Pakistan or Indonesia or whatever, or Saudi Arabia, and they should belong to them. There is nothing wrong in nationalizing them. Today it has become known, but it took the whole of the Iranian government in turmoil for several years to recover from that shock of uh, the coup. There are many other things like that which go on <clears throat> in terms of resource monopolization, mineral resources, resource extraction, all kinds of things which continue to happen. Now, obviously, in colonial times, there was no question. There was nobody to ask, what are you doing? 
why are you taking these minerals away or gold away or whatever away without paying us anything for it? It belongs to us because it was colonial. But post-colonial, after independence, it also continued the same and it this became known as neo-colonialism. Still started to uh, continue to uh, exploit these resources for the benefit of the developed countries, companies, and so on. If, for example, if you look at the extraction of uh, gold, zinc, titanium, and other things from what was uh, Congo, and still is the Democratic Republic of Congo, you see the country has been completely devastated, but these things are being extracted all the time and taken away by huge companies which are based in the West and monopolized by them. They don't care about the conditions of the workers, their rights or whatever. And you can duplicate this over and over and over. <clears throat> now, over a period of time, these techniques and methods have been systematic systematically incorporated into a global structure. If you now look at the global structure, you have, for example, the International Monetary Fund, then you have the World Bank and its subsidiaries, the International Development Association and the IFC, International Finance Corporation and so on. All of them technically are designed to help the developing countries, but actually their method of working shows that they want free access to resources without appropriate uh, imparting of technology or compensation. Now, those of you who have uh, followed the IMF, World Bank and so on, will not see so much directly because you really have to look at them in detailed discussions with the management there, the projects, profiles, and so on to see what is happening. But out of that, two other institutions came out, which are very, very interesting for the discussion we are having. The major one of them is called the WTO, the World Trade Organization. This is based in Geneva and it is supposed to regulate trade between countries. The World Trade Organization, <clears throat> obviously when it was formed, it was only developed countries and so they laid down all the terms. As other countries started to join, they had to make adjustments. <clears throat> Two particular uh, methodologies which they developed. One is called TRIPS, which is Trade Related Intellectual Property Rights. This is what you would understand by things like patents, intellectual property, copyrights, laws, and so on. This is what protects technically the patents of mostly companies in the developed West or Japan. So if you breach those patents, you could be penalized or removed from the system and so on. The second one of this uh, framework groups is called TRIMS, Trade Related Investment Measures, which are again freedom for these people to invest and do what they like in most countries. And here I like to give you an example, which is really very disturbing. In the 90s, the tobacco companies were beginning to feel that their markets 
in the developed countries were being squeezed because of restrictions, as you know, and we know we started by a banning smoking in public transport, public spaces, aircraft, these, that, all kinds of things. And gradually that meant that the market was not growing. Tobacco companies thinking that how can we maintain our business? They identified one particular group of people who did not generally smoke. And that was young women in developing countries. As you know, from our countries, women normally do not smoke as much as men. So they started to say that, no, we must market and we must bring that group into smoking. I remember we dealing with a case in Thailand, which Thailand was forced or was being forced to agree for advertisement to young women. Now, as you know, smoking by women of childbearing age is the most harmful activity that you can do. And they took Thailand to the WTO and made a case against them that these people are restricting our investment and marketing. And this is against the law. Now you can see the battle here between NGOs, which we belong to on the ground, the law and companies in the developed uh, world, which wanted to push that kind of activity. And there are many, many activities like that which were being pushed and are being pushed all the time uh, on developing countries. And to give you a small another example is uh, a company called Monsanto in India. You know that in farming generally, farmers when they harvest a crop, they then use part of the seeds to grow the next crop. This obviously is a pattern and it is more sustainable. Monsanto came up with a seed which they called terminator seed, which will not be able to be grown again, only one time, which means the farmer every time has to buy new seed from another company. And it needs more fertilizer and more water than general. And so they instituted a system which really impacted on the farming whilst producing crops which were more suitable for mass exports. In this way, these companies in different directions, whatever direction you look at, you will find that they have instituted at the international level through the WTO in Geneva, all kinds of uh, uh, laws and regulations which force these countries to be able to not do what they want to do. There were then obviously quite a number of other things which need to be uh, discussed at some future date when we have how they want to embed uh, monoculture planting and all kinds of environmental degradation, so on and so forth which on the face of it may appear to be development, but in the long term, it completely destroys the place and doesn't allow it to grow. So that's the WTO and obviously patents and things beside in them. Um, patent regulations, again, allow them monopoly extraction of profits on whatever they discover or claim to be discovering. The next organization is called the WHO. The WHO, the World Health Organization, you will have heard now because of the pandemic and the coronavirus, uh, is in charge of seeing if they can bring uh, some semblance of order into the market for vaccines. As you know, at the moment, <clears throat> we have probably two thirds of 
people in developed countries being vaccinated, but probably less than 5% in the developing countries being vaccinated from the very virus. This is because, first of all, the companies are not willing to sell to these countries which cannot pay. Uh, countries which want to pay, they will get um, a higher price and they will pay a higher price. Canada, for example, I think, if I'm not mistaken, has bought four times the number of vaccines as the population of the whole of Canada, paying an average of $20 per dose. Companies like AstraZeneca, which decided to do something for the common good and market the vaccine at cost, have been marginalized through one stratagem or another. Countries like India were not able to export to other countries, developing countries, but had to develop, export to developed countries. Vaccine nationalism, vaccine patents, and so on really created a huge problem for developing countries in terms of how to control this disease. But this is not one disease. Patents in medicine and pharmaceuticals have become very common and are therefore, uh, you know, beginning to be monopolized. I think Brother Nazmul wants to say something. Just wanted to ask you, why was India not allowed to sent to the developing nations, the vaccines? Yeah, two things. One, the uh, people like uh, UK, for example, put so much orders there and they reserved them. Secondly, India itself said, you can't send anywhere else until our own need is fulfilled. So <laughs> the whole supply was monopolized by two or three big customers. It's India forced, of course, for its own, but also forced, uh, company was forced to sell to UK and others uh, before supplying to anybody else. Thank you. So it is, this is just, the vaccines are just the tip of the iceberg. Everywhere you go, there is a problem. And the biggest problem systematically is this. For example, I always ask my students, how much are you paying for a can of Coca-Cola? And they might come back with different answers, but say roughly, if you would say even in Canadian terms, one dollar. Then the next question I ask is that, how much do the raw materials in that can of Coke cost? And the most highest answer I get is 15 cents. So the next question we ask is, what happens to the other 85 cents? 15 cents you pay to the farmer, the water, the tin, or whatever, whatever. Where is the 85 cents gone? And you go through and you say that most of it has gone to advertising, marketing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all in the developed countries. Even the can of Coke is sold in Dar es Salaam. This 85 cents comes here. So service revenue, not raw material revenue, has become big and critical. And service revenue is monopolized by developed countries. And so this perpetuates a system. Now, how do they prevent other countries from developing that? And look at, for example, coffee, right? Kenya. Uganda are big producers of coffee. But they do not produce ready coffee, Nescafe or whatever other brand, yeah? Coffee beans are shipped. They are then ground and made into coffee in developed countries, tinned, and then sent back to those countries for selling, generally. There are a few exceptions, but generally. So the revenue, bulk of the revenue stays in developed countries. If by any chance some country wants to develop their own coffee production in that sense, full end to end, these people have got a mechanism to charge them tariffs 
or custom duties so that they do not become competitive in these markets. So you see, through these mechanisms, you keep the revenue in those countries. This is not colonialism. This is not neo-colonialism. This is straight, very open trade regulation now. And I can take you through tens and hundreds of examples like this, where different countries really haven't been able to do anything outside the box, if you like. They've been left as commodity producers, garment manufacturers. Until recently, for example, we also saw <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> that countries like China also, until 20 years ago, 15 years ago, they used to make all the components for, say, computers, uh, mobile phones, and so on. But the value stayed with the developed countries through patent protection, tariff protection, and so on. However, <clears throat> in the last 20 years, just before this financial crisis and before that, uh, uh, with the changing circumstances and what we call <clears throat> globalization, many companies in the developed countries started to form or make plants manufacturing in developing countries, especially China, India, Korea, South Korea, and so on. What they thought was that they could still continue to monopolize. But what they found very quickly is that those people were perhaps more smarter, more able than they thought, and they were able to do much more than they were supposed to be doing. And slowly, we saw that a lot of jobs were lost in developed countries. A lot of goods were manufactured to high quality and high specification in developing countries like China, Korea. And all the goods started to come from there to here. This again presented a challenge to the system, um, especially when China was admitted to the WTO, the World Trade Organization. Therefore, it was subject to the same rules and regulations as other countries, but it was doing things and it was progressing at the rate which these people thought would just overtake them. And then when somebody like Trump came, they started to think about this and said, no, 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 we cannot have this. So they started to build China as an enemy. Stopped, uh, started to decouple and put patent restrictions, restrictions on chip manufacturing and chip supplies to Chinese companies and so on. And this whole uh, huge movement for shift to the uh, security shift to the Chinese uh, part of the world from the Middle East and uh, you know Europe and so on, before Russia, of course, was symptomatic of that, that China now presented a big threat. Globalization really wasn't really, uh, it was working for our companies, but for our own countries was not working. And therefore, we needed to stop it. Now, effectively, before the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the whole idea was to cut globalization uh, in its tracks and see if we can control the whole process again. So you see, as soon as you get to a stage where you are beginning to make some change and some movement, the systems in the developed countries cannot tolerate it. They want to be able to assert themselves and control. But people, when they do something, they learn something as well. It's not something which they are not robots, or they are not controllable in that sense. They learn something, and they can do better than you in many other things, which they have done in many countries. And so the whole discussion opens up again, how to control. And the United States was even found in breach of WTO regulations, but because what they did, 
And this is the other tricks you must, if you follow the things in detail, you will see. They refuse to agree to appoint the judges on the WTO. And therefore, the judgment process of the WTO has been suspended for a number of years since the beginning of term. Because if the WTO says that you are in breach, then there will be tariff implications and all kinds of other things going on. So I think today's uh, situation, global situation, demands us to understand these organizations in detail, to see how they are serving a particular agenda, and to make sure that they are really very little different from what I told you about uh, Musaddiq of that time. They don't want control or profits to pass to anybody else. Whereas challenges which are coming are even bigger. I mean, vaccines you have seen already, but more than vaccine is climate change. Climate change is coming. The problem with climate change is that it is a slow and incremental process. Therefore, you do not see it day to day. It's not like vaccine. You don't see people dying. You only see it over a period of time. When your climate changes, you had a heat wave on your uh, Western front, as you know, last year. And it was completely unprecedented. But if that happens over and over and over, we are going to be in deep trouble. So climate change, unfortunately, um, requires very deep thinking and very much broader global cooperation. People who are responsible for polluting are not necessarily people who will suffer. Or people who have polluted more during historic recent times should be able to sacrifice more in order to let other people uh, not be infected with these things. But you know, we are saying in developed countries that we are okay, we can do this and this, uh, we have not done anything, we can't, uh, we want the, you to stop deforesting, we want you to do this, we want you to do this, we want you to do this. There is no common purpose. There is no understanding how we can um, you know, cooperate and build some kind of consensus that this is the, you know, interest of humanity as a whole, and we should put it together. We saw during COP26, for example, which is the climate change summit which we had in London last year, end of last year, negotiations between different countries and especially uh, United States and other countries, they just said during Trump time, they said, this is all hoax. We, we are willing it and we don't want it. The present administration is slightly better, but still the vested interests in the United States do not allow. And unfortunately, the Russian invasion of Ukraine gives everybody an excuse to forget about all that and concentrate on getting the oil or the coal or whatever, however polluting from wherever possible. So you see now <clears> that <throat> in this whole game, developed countries will find it very difficult to be able to develop themselves as competitors on the table. Uh, just to give you another example, China, some years ago, started to think about creating its own infrastructure. And it started what it's called the Belt and Road Initiative, which started to build railways and roads and ports and things in different parts of the world and has invested billions, billions of dollars into this. Again, the idea was that it will, uh, it, China is not your uncle or my uncle, doesn't do us a favor, it's looking at its own self-interest, obviously, but would rather have two or three people looking after the show of interest and we benefit from that competition. And they built some very good, beautiful roads in Pakistan and other places. Um, 
they have put some other countries in debt and so on, obviously. But the idea is that the transit route from China to Europe, if that whole initiative is taken forward, will be about 14 to 15 days. The transit road to the transit time at the moment is about 30 to 35 days by ship. The transit time during the Silk Road days, six months, when the control of the Silk Road obviously was with the Muslims at that time, that was the best uh, optional route. Then the discovery of the sea route uh, by Europeans undercut that route. And now China's plan is to undercut the sea route again and pose a competition. Obviously with 1 billion plus people in China, 1 billion plus in India and 1 billion on the way, we're already looking at 60% of the global population being serviced through these kind of initiatives. And this is going to be a major challenge unless it is interrupted by war, initiated deliberately or otherwise, or all kinds of other things which will happen. So I want to really put forward the idea that if we think that global architecture, trade, patents, intellectual property rights, and global institutions are there to service the interests of everybody, we are mistaken. They are primarily servicing the interests of the developed countries and trying to keep the developing countries as markets, uh, hungry markets, rather than as equal partners. And until that happens, until equal partnership comes, to solve the problems like climate change and so on, is going to be very, very difficult. So I'd like to end with two uh, proposals or two ideas, really. The one is a very beautiful paper by Pope Francis. Pope Francis, as you know, is the current Pope and he's been shaking the Catholic establishment on many things. But one of his uh, encyclicals, from time to time, Popes issue what are called encyclicals. They are not fatwas, but they are kind of um, exhortations to the Catholic community. One of his encyclicals is called Laidato Sai, which is the common good. And in there, the Pope says that, look, the business of the church is not to look after the poor people. You, says to the general community, continue to create more and more poor people and expect us to look after them. No, the business of the church should be to stop poor people being created so that together we can move forward. And this is a very big indictment of the present system that we sort of say charities and others should take care of this problem. We have nothing to do with it. However, that's where the discussion is on that. But the last thing I want to say is a very, very beautiful example from the life of our beloved prophet. You know, after the Hijra from Makkah to Medina, the prophet called the Muhajirin and Ansar together. And he gave the hand of one person from the Muhajirin to one person from the Ansar. And he said, from today, you are going to be brothers. Share everything you have. This is the common good. This is an act of faith. And imagine if I tell you that today, what will be the reaction between us? But that act of faith took Muslims to grow from China to Andalusia in Spain in a hundred years. Because the prophet created that spirit of the common good, which was the only way to solve these problems. So 
So I hope, inshallah, this has been useful and I'm happy to take uh, questions if you have. Assalamu alaikum. One question in the chat. Uh, Bashir, you there? Yes, I am. Okay, yeah. go ahead. Okay. Um, this is from uh, Dr. Hussein Kimji. Salaam alaikum. Extremely interesting, Professor Saria. Thank you for this. My question is, where are all the intellectuals and leaders from the religious point of view? Uh, where are all the ulama, I guess, to bring about from the grassroots some kind of movement? some kind of understanding. So, uh, Brother Hussain, you are absolutely correct <clears throat> that we should have our scholars, our intellectuals looking at these issues, thinking about them and strategizing about them, and then obviously encouraging the people to behave accordingly. Unfortunately, as you say, there isn't that much of an awareness there, or even the intention of awareness. Now, I have been fighting uh, with a number of institutions, religious institutions, that this, you should have this kind of debates and discussions in your curricula so that our students especially those who are inclined towards religious studies, should build up the capacity to understand and think about it. Yeah, we, we, we don't have any other questions, but just to fill in the gap, uh, I see uh, uh, Dr. Kimji has raised his uh, hand. So go ahead, uh, Dr. Kimji. Yeah, 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 thank you so very, very much. Professor Staria, thank you. And wonderful, um, you know, talk wonderful, you know, explanation, uh, quite interesting and open our mind. Uh, my question was not only, you know, related to the, well, I, I was also thinking about other scholars as well, you know, other thinkers as well, you know, in the society. I mean, uh, how come this is the very first time that we are, you know, hearing, you know, about the WTO and the WHO in such great detail and such interesting detail. I mean, how come we have not heard anything like this from other sources? Uh, we, you know, we hear you know, all kinds of, you know, lectures in the masajid as well. This was my second point, you know, uh, but, you know, nothing like that to bring about, you know, some kind of thinking, some kind of grassroots change. And this was my question. It's very interesting. Thank you. So, uh, if you like, this is an opening shot, <laughs> Professor Kimji, and we can follow through. And uh, I hope that many new members will be talking about WTO and WHO and whatever. But as you can see, these are integral to our future and existence, really. It is not something which we can afford to ignore. And uh, you're right that we haven't grasped the nettle. Even the intellectuals in our societies who have uh, mastered all kinds of other disciplines and sciences haven't gone this route. And I, 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 I really feel grateful to a couple of people who forced me to go into this area in the 1980s. And they said, you must, as an economist, look at this. And I, I still am so thankful to them that they opened my eyes to things which were not clear. Um. Dr. Bashir Datu has uh, uh, a question. Excellent presentation on the international institutions that retard the development of third world countries. However, to what extent the developing countries themselves have failed to adopt policies that would endanger development? For example, they continued after independence, the policies of colonial powers that have been described as disjointed incrementalism, as opposed to adopting progressive policies that focus on what is called structural transformation of the internal economies of developing countries. I think this is a very, very important uh, observation that obviously you cannot clap with one hand. 
uh, we must also share some of the blame for the situation. We can't just say everything is from there. So yes, um, there is a very, very prominent uh, Algerian scholar called Malik bin Nabi. Malik bin Nabi has written a very interesting book, which is called Colonizability. And he argues that if we were not colonizable, we would not have been colonized. He said we had become colonizable. Therefore, people were able to exploit our differences and all kinds of things and dominate us and so on. So you are right. And you can see that different societies have developed different kinds of resilience on these things. Even countries which we may disagree with, when we were looking at the World Bank and Geo Committee list, we found, for example, that the officials and others in Ethiopia at that time were much more uh, knowledgeable, much more able to negotiate their position than, for example, Kenya or Tanzania or even South Africa. So really, clearly, there was something there in their educational system, in their culture, which gave them a little bit of confidence to discuss and argue with these people. India, obviously, has much more um, status than other countries in some of the organizations and so on. But obviously, even given that, you cannot discount the influence of people, outside people who want to create their own agenda. In India, for example, they planted all kinds of officials from US universities, Indians, with a particular agenda, trying to defeat the local version of whatever was needed. So you're right, it is a complex problem. And it is something which we just need to overcome, but we need to develop the confidence first that we can do it. Not accept that, okay, there's no other alternative, therefore we do that. I see Nazbul Jam just got his raised hand, we're followed by Mohsen Kimji, also raised hand. Again, Nazbul. yes, thank you, thank you, Mr. Uh, professor raises so many issues and, you know, the, the problems have arisen over the years, over centuries, actually. So when the developed nations have so much power, you can educate the masses through your churches and through your mosques and through everybody, at least raise awareness is one thing. But when you get developed nations who control the market to set the price of coffee or cotton or produce or your minerals and everything, it's all controlled by the West. The corporations have so much power. United Nations, the whole structure, World Trade Organization you talked about, World Health Organization, Everything is stacked against the developing nations. Isn't the answers for the developing nations to come together? You know, like against Russia, all the Western powers have come together, right? The financial systems, petro petrodollar, US dollar, everything is in US dollar. You want to send money to India, I mean, there's no other way. You have to use their system, right? Face now going on to the corporate sector, Facebook, Google. I mean, they have so much power, which the Western countries are facing too, you know, the power they have. But against all these odds, I, I, I sound like a defeatist, but what, how do you see this developing? It took India, you know, how many years of colonization awareness through the Gandhi movement and all that before they got independence. And that is not comparing it to you know, the problems we are talking about, but it is a multi-generational, multi, not just decades, probably multi-centuries uh, issue. Again, your comments, please. 
Um, yes, I, um, I share your sentiments, but I think uh, if you look at the last 50 years, things are moving a little bit, as I showed, obviously the rise of China has come through all these things. China was even uh, the same state as India, for example, at that time, now it is 10 times richer. Countries like Malaysia have made some progress. There was also the development of uh, the group called BRICS, who started to bring developing countries together to see if we can uh, negotiate on this agenda. South American companies and Eastern countries, India, Indonesia, and so on, have been collaborating at uh, general um, forums. But also important in this one, Mumbai, which is why our role is there. If we can energize people in our country, in here, in the UK, in Canada, to understand these issues and fight, we can change. We have in the UK, for example, the fair trade movement, which demands fair compensation for farmers. We have people who want to ban child labor, people who want to ban supply chains, which do not remunerate the workers properly. So pressure can also come from here, in which case the two sides become much easier. Yes, it is not a small process, but we have people here, if we are able to explain to them these processes, these problems, and say that this can never happen unless we change, we should pressurize our companies to change like exactly what we are trying to do with climate change. We are saying that, no, if you are going to be polluting, we're not going to buy your goods. Therefore, they have to revise their uh, practices, sourcing, and so on. So it is a double-edged problem. Confidence on our countries, plus support from constituencies in our host countries now. I think that's excellent uh, response uh, to my issues. And uh, yes, you're right. Uh, the, there is light at the end of the tunnel, but uh, I, 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 I won't see the changes in my lifetime. Gradual changes, yes, but structural changes, because they always come up with their own ways. They have their CI and MI, whatever else, right? They will go and topple the group. How are they controlling the Muslim world and the oil markets and everything? Okay, so go ahead. <laughs> so you're right, uh, you're right. Uh, and that is one of the discussions we had, and this is really interesting for us, is that do we prefer the East, China and so on, or the West, America and Europe? And the big discussion we had, uh, this was a group of, uh, you know, oil type group, which we have, not religious, but general. And we said that the preference would be for America and the West, because there is a possibility of influencing people there. If you start doing something like that in China, you'll be out of, <laughs> out of your life very quickly. So this was the uh, kind of overall conclusion we had that we can actually empower or and, uh, we can join groups in these countries which understand what we are talking about and then we mobilize and lobby for changes, which we have seen some changes obviously in terms of supply chains, in terms of uh, minimal wages, in terms of uh, child labor. I mean, com com country, companies like Nike, for example, are no longer using child labor in their supply line because people don't want to wear it if they do that, yeah? But we can do more, but it's, it's uh, our imagination and our will to influence our neighbors. When we are not even talking to our neighbors here, we can't do much, but we have to really get there at the table and say, look, what are you talking about? Let's see. Thank you, thank you. So you take up so much of time, Mosin. Yeah. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Asaria. I don't know if you will remember me or not, but I traveled with you in 1980 to Iran through Muslim youth organization that you had organized and got to learn a lot for which I can't thank you enough. But uh, my question today is this, what do you see the role of Iran? 
whom I admire and support so much. You know, where do you see where do you see things going, especially with also this nuclear thing? And secondly, the point that you bring up, I remember watching this program years ago on BBC TV, and uh, they were uh, interviewing a late president Nyerere. And the program was called, I believe, Five Minutes to Midnight. You may have seen it. And President Nyerere was making the point that, you know, you will, that we used to sell a bag of coffee and we used to get one pound of rice. I'm just using my own example. Yeah. Today, we are selling the same bag of coffee to you, okay? But we are only getting quarter pound of rice because you have increased your prices so much and you will not allow us to increase. So this type of mechanism are still there. And where do, so it's really very hard to see how to juggle from there because you know they have so much maneuvering power that they will never let the developing countries grow. I'm not being pessimistic, but just saying, you know, look with the nuclear Iran deal. You know, the United Nations had approved it. Once the United Nations approves, how can America come and say no? You know, United Nations is supposed to be higher. So what is the worth of that organization today? Nothing. You know, that was my comments. Thank you. So I think uh, to take your first point, as I said, uh, began with the idea with the incident of the coup against uh, Prime Minister Mohammad Musaddiq uh, for daring to nationalize oil, which belonged to the people of Iran. Uh, it still persists. Iran has got this independent streak, which they feel is an example which should not be set, not be allowed to be set. And therefore, all kinds of restrictions and things have happened to them. And Iran has got its own internal faults and so on. We are not saying that it is a perfect state by any means, but overall, it is posing a major challenge to the order in the sense of being able to do things um, which they never thought they could do, well, that Iran could do. And it continues to pose that. Iran has already said that we are not developing nuclear weapons, but we should be able to have nuclear technology. And this is the discussion going on. But they are coming up with all kinds of excuses. On the other hand, what you say, about the power of global corporations and things is correct. But as I said, if we are able to lobby, penetrate, work in organizations here and explain to the people that this is not good, this will not work long term, it only looks at disaster, then I think we can make progress by pro putting pressure on them from inside their companies in big time. And I think this is something where I strongly believe we should be putting our energies into. And I have seen changes which are amazing in terms of what can be achieved. First of all, I don't have any questions in the chat. Uh, I don't know if anybody else wants to ask a question or a comment on uh, the presentation. Um, I can just raise one final point. Um, number one is, uh, Professor Saria, we couldn't deliver the quantity, but I think we gave you the quality of the attendees. So <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm grateful to everybody who joined. Uh, my final question is, uh, in a country, when the population is unhappy, there is a revolution. They always talk about, you know, sort of the France and the example there, right? What I was saying earlier is the developing nations getting together and causing some kind of revolution to change the whole system. Is that ever possible or is this too wild an idea? I don't think it is too wild. I mean, you can see, for example, that on vaccine production, African countries are getting together. 
and they are saying we are going to do it regardless of you. They are making quite decent progress on that. I think if they succeed in that, that will give them ideas about other things incrementally, that yes, we can do it. So it's a question of trying to find out, but vaccines are important in the sense that at the moment, the public here is sympathetic to them. They say, yeah, they should have. And that is what I mean, that we should keep a really good track of the public in these countries so that the politicians are not able to just uh, wipe us out without uh, looking back at their own public. This is the key message I want to give that really slow but surely the process is in our hands and it's what we need to do if we want to reply to Allah that we did our best. Excellent point. Bashir Bhai, are we okay? Yeah, we're okay. I think we've uh, yeah. put up. Uh, there is uh, Muhammad Raza Rani. Greetings from myself, Muhammad Raza Rani from Gujarat, India. Excellent presentation. Uh, I'm just quickly reading this out. Uh, excellent presentation by Professor Asaria. There was definitely very much to learn from it. So I guess uh, a nice compliment to you, Dr. Asaria. Well, yeah, I just want to say uh, so much indebted to you for making time for us, uh, Professor Saria. Uh, I knew we wouldn't be disappointed and uh, we had a uh, good discussion. Certainly, you know, there has to be more awareness, at least within the community, more people should be thinking about these issues and uh, not just uh, our community, all communities in the wider population. And then gradually over time, change will come. Um, yes, you cited so many examples where yes, changes have come through fair trade and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so again, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. And we uh, um, all learned, uh, you know, something new. Uh, so again, thanks once more. Thank, Thank you, very you much. everybody. And yeah. Maybe see you again in a year's time or whatever. <laughs> whenever you're <laughs> Inshallah sooner. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you everybody for joining and see you again uh, in May uh, after Eid. Kudafis. Thank Salaam you. Alaikum. Okay.